everybody. Hey, welcome to Umpire Coaching. And this is a podcast where we talk with coaches and umpires about the various aspects of youth baseball and softball for both umpires and coaches. My name's James. Uh, I've been umpiring and coaching since just about the turn of the century. And with me is Roger. Hey, Roger. Hello, James. And Roger, uh, can tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, so I've been umpiring for probably about five years now, and uh, and I've been a parent uh, with his son. Son's playing baseball for about eight. Enjoyed the game since I've been a kid, so I just enjoy the rules and I enjoy the different aspects that come from it. And uh, also with me is Darren. Uh, hey, Darren, what what can you tell us about yourself? Hey, James, good to be back. I have been an umpire since 99. It's as high as uh, lower division college ball, NAIA uh, community college on the softball side and on the little league side, both baseball and softball from ages five all the way up to age 18. Awesome. And then it looks like uh, Eric just chimed in. How are you, you doing, there, Eric? I'm good. How about you guys? Yeah, good, good. Uh, can you tell us about yourself real quick? Uh, yeah, I've been a high school baseball coach, played high school baseball all the way through. I uh, oh, got after college, started coaching baseball, coached some high school ball for a number of years, and then uh, started coaching my kids about six years ago when they started playing uh, Little League. Awesome. So I've umpired with a lot of you guys, the all-star teams, and that's my experience. Sweet. All right. Well, so uh, this topic is going to be fun. I've been thinking about titles for it, and one of them I'm thinking about is Get Out of My Way. Uh, we're going to talk about base paths, and uh, what we'll start with is the, is the rule, and we'll go ahead and have Roger read the MLB rule, and then we'll have Darren read the Little League rule, and then we'll uh, have a little bit of discussion, then we've got some questions to follow a couple scenarios to discuss and we'll get you guys on your way so roger if you want to just uh read the mlb rule if you would so the mlb rule is 509 b1 uh, and it says he runs more than three feet away from his base path to avoid being tagged unless his action is to avoid interference with a fielder fielding a batted ball a runner's base path is established when his when the tag attempt occurs and is a straight line from the runner to the base he's attempting to reach safely perfect okay and darren if you could uh read us the little league rule yes i will little league baseball rule is 7.08 a1 and it starts running more than three feet away from his or her base path to avoid being tagged unless such action is to avoid interference with the fielder fielding a batted ball a runner's base path is established when the tag attempt occurs and is a straight line from the runner to the base, which he or she is attempting to reach. Perfect. So, and this is this question then, of course, is for Eric. Those don't sound very different. Well, let's talk about the difference a little bit. What, what do you, you might know a little more than we do, Darren, about that. Could you provide a little insight on the difference of those two rules? Yes. The major league rule, in my opinion, is saying they're attempting to reach the base safely, and safely is the key word. So my interpretation of the Little League rule would be that in an attempt to acquire the base, they are at least in the vicinity of trying to reach that base safely. Whereas in the Little League side, your, your, your slight attempt, your attempt to reach that, that base might not necessarily be as sharp and direct towards the bag as, a, as Major League Baseball. So that's a really important distinct distinction that we're making here. Uh, you know, we've been combing over the book looking for the words base path. Is there a base path? I think it's baseline, James. We're looking for baseline. That's baseline or base path, either one. Right. Yeah. Does the wording matter? between base path and baseline? From an umpire perspective, I would say, yes, it does. Simply because we we picture the baseline as being what would be your foul fair lines, starting at the tip of the plate, extending to the fence, uh, differentiating between fair and foul territory. Whereas a base path for us would be that path that is formed when an attempt is being made on a runner who is trying to advance between bases, either in a forward direction or back to the base they went from. So, you know, and and I'm just going to kind of jump into some scenarios here because we get uh, we get a lot of little league coaches that don't really understand this rule. And uh, that's kind of one of the reasons why Eric's joining us today. What's interesting about it, I, I don't know how many times I've been on the field as an umpire and I have a coach yell at me because there's a 
there's a defender, like the third baseman, standing, you know, in a line between third base and second base, and we have a runner at second. I have had coach saying, he can't stand there. He can't stand there. He's he's standing in my runner's base path. Uh, have you guys had things like that before? And, you know, what are your thoughts? Anybody jump in? <laughs> Eric? <laughs> oh, I was waiting to hear what the umpire's opinion on that one. I always run into that one. That's a, that's a, that's, that's one that this is a safe place to talk about. Field is never a good place to phrase that question. In my opinion, or the way I've always understood it, was there is no baseline or base path when there is not a tag being made or an attempt or a tag to be made. So a player can essentially stand anywhere. Now, could obstruction... In, in fair inter- territory, of in course. In fair territory, yes. Could there be obstruction or interference? It's, that's absolutely possible down the road if you have a runner standing in the path of a, uh, or a player, a defensive player standing in the path of a runner trying to advance a base. But at the start of a play, it doesn't matter where they stand. They could stand anywhere. I'm not in Major League Baseball anymore, but yeah. anywhere. Uh, in order to defend their position. No, that's that's my, and that that's the answer I give them, and they look at me like I've lost my mind. Yeah, the hard part is when they when they go when a runner goes and runs around that guy going to field the ball, which or, you're supposed to do you know, by the run, way, runs right into him. You know, because yeah. what happens when that runner runs right into the guy fielding the ball? Does that fielder have a right to the ball? Or does the fielder or does the runner have the right to the base? The, yeah. the fielder has the right to the ball. Yeah, we right. actually had a situation. Uh, I was watching a high school game last year. Two of the players that James coached actually were involved in this play once upon a time. And uh, third baseman was uh, was uh, getting down to field a sharply hit ground ball. Uh, the runner from shortstop, the runner that was at R2 that was running toward third, had his head down on a steal, just absolutely not did not see the third baseman and blew him up by accident more or less kid uh the kid was a special kid is anyways they had they called the runner out for obstructing or for interference on the uh the fielding player so even though he was in the baseline so so the obstruction and the interference is going to be discussed in a neck in another podcast we actually have uh some other people that that will help us review that but it is related to what we're talking about with the the base path and the base line. That, that's that's what happens when we allow coaches to get excited and upset and we try to calm them down and say look but but the reality that Roger is is and and uh, Eric is the defender has a right to go get to to a baseball and it is the runner's job to avoid that 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 field or that defender trying to receive a ball. And the same on a throw. They, he can't interfere with the throw. And Darren, you want to chime in on that? I see you kind of looking up on that. Is it, there, We have bang bangs and we have train wrecks, right? But we also have scenarios where you have runners that are actually, you know, and, I, and we'll get into the runner slaying because that's important for this topic. But uh, what's what? I'm curious, you know, for your thoughts. At every level of play, whether it's boys or girls playing the game, the fielder always has a hundred percent right away to the ball. That's indisputable. So if in your judgment, the fielder only had 99% or 98%, we're going to have interference. And as you said earlier, that's going to be another podcast. So in any situation on a ground ball, line drive, anything like that, the runner always has to yield the right of way to some capacity. And there's different ways that can be done. Again, that'll probably be talked about later. Getting back to your scenario with fielders starting in the base path prior to a play, the one time that I really see it abused the most is at first base. I see first basemen creep up, stand in the way of the runner, and they're impeding the runner from getting a good jump. And if I see that runner deviate, slow down, in any way, and the ball is not being hit to the first baseman, and this could be while the pitch is deemed being delivered, I'm obligated to call obstruction on that first baseman. So that's that's just a heads up thing I look for when I see first baseman that's starting the base path. If it's a shortstop or a second baseman, there's plenty of time for them to go forward or go backward and yield the right of way to the runner if there's no play being made. So, but at, at those really young levels, though, when there is a kid, say that third base scenario, we're not talking about Dylan Damos just drilling somebody at third. Uh, that guy, he, he can't just stand there in the base path, right? Because exactly what you're talking about, if, if they're obstructing, if the runner's making, if there's no ball hit to the third baseman and the guy at second is running the third and the kid's just standing there just oblivious and the runner can go around him, but if, if he runs into him, is that is that obstruction? If 
if he's kind of watching where the ball is going and then boom, there's a third baseman standing in front of him and he runs right into him. Is that instruction? Does he have the right to that base? Well, hopefully we won't have the collision. But if we do, yeah, you're 100% right. We can treat that as type B because there's no play being made at that moment. And then later on with type B, we have the ability to decide, should would that runner have had a chance to score? And if our in our judgment, they could have scored, we can award them home. We're not going to automatically award them home. If they right. snap a third, we're not going to do that. But if they have to deviate, if they have to stop, if they run into that third baseman who doesn't get out of the way, now as umpires, we get to judge whether they could have gotten the next base or not, and then award accordingly. There's a different type of obstruction that's, that's a one base award automatically, and that's type A. And again, you guys are gonna talk about A and B at a later date, yep. so I don't wanna go too deep into that. I have, a, I have a question for Darren on that with the yeah. with the type B. So if you have a runner, it's, then there's a, a your, your R2, you're running to three, uh, and the third baseman, the shortstop's in your way. I always told my kid not to collide with them, but just to like tap them on the shoulder or obviously go out of your way, but make contact, like some kind of gentle contact with them to show like, hey, they're in my way to the umpire so that there was some kind of contact so that there would be an obstruction call potentially, or is that just like... I would not encourage players to force contact in any manner, whether okay. it's gentle or not, because all they have to do for me is alter their path or or stop. I mean, those are one of two things that, it, that can occur. With my right hand, I'm going to point right at the third baseman and say that's obstruction. Hopefully the third base coach will pick up on that. He'll He'll know what I'm doing and he'll know the difference between A and B. But it, it's a very great area when you start encouraging players to make contact with other players. Some umpires may take offense to it. Others like me would go, you don't have to teach them to tap. I've already got the obstruction, whether there's contact or no contact. That's the thing to really always teach to always teach our field umps too to watch rather than making sure that they know that whether type A or type B or that the fielder has the right to the ball, but if there's no ball on the field or obstructs the runner, then the runner has, you know, then we see obstruction because all too often there's so many things going on. There's a play going on on that ball and when we're third base coach and that kid runs into the third baseman who may or may not have a, you know, be playing out of position because usually a good third baseman is going to get out of the way of the runner. But your third baseman that you're just trying to work in to get experience playing in the infield and oftentimes that's when that happens and we see that a lot and then maybe we don't have you Darren as our umpire we have somebody else who didn't see it another good good example of why we always need a good field field dump out there also I can tell you that Roger and I and uh, Darren have flown solo way too many times <laughs> and the reality is we're just, we're just not going to see everything that there is I mean we're looking for the big stuff and the high the high hanging fruit we're probably going to miss and that's just uh, so and this is something that I I don't know if minors and majors coaches are coaching this because I never see it drawn on our home games uh, down at the field. But the runner's lane. Could you talk a little bit, uh, Darren, about the runner's lane? And it, we know it applies whether it's drawn or not. Can we talk a little bit about why it's there, why it's important? Yeah, you bet. Uh, the purpose for the runner's lane is for situations like an uncaught third strike, uh, coaches would recognize that terminology as a drop third strike, or a situation where a bunch is laid down, or even a full swing ball that doesn't travel very far in front of the plate, half the distance to the base. So if we're talking about a 90 foot diamond at the 45 foot line, we have a lane that is chalked in foul territory. We expect the runner to start out in fair territory after they swing the bat, especially a right-handed batter. So now their job at the halfway point is to get to the foul side of the foul fair line. In doing so, we're going to protect them from a throw coming from the catcher or the pitcher or any fielder making a play on the ball is attempting to throw it to the first baseman. If they're in that runner's lane, we're going to protect them from that throw. If they're straddling that runner's lane, they're not entirely in it, and we have a quality throw to first base, we could now have interference on that batter runner because they're not doing what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to get on the foul side. And we're doing that to keep them out of harm's way. We're not doing that to penalize them. So Roger and I were talking about this earlier. And one of the things that, uh, that interests me on that is, do they have to be in that lane? A lot of times, kids are taught to not run that straight line, but to round it and actually be traveling way in foul territory and then cut, curve in 
to first at, and, and on a big hit you'll see him doing that and you know that may not be the case but if you've got somebody who's actually on the right side of the foul lane or of the the runner's lane what do you have there i mean is it that's they're not in the protected place but they're certainly not in foul territory what, what do you have with that well you've still got the potential for interference okay and they're basically required to be in that chute or in that lane to be protected from a throw coming from behind. Now, if you're teaching them to run wide because the ball's hitting the outfield, you're doing exactly what you should be doing as a coach. Uh, One thing I want to caution is in order to obtain first base by a battle runner, their last step or two, they are going to have to come back into fair territory. So I would caution any umpire against calling interference if that last step to two steps is back in fair territory and they're touching first base because there's nowhere else for that runner to go Mm -hmm. without having to slow down or pause, but to come back into fair territory. Does that make any sense? And I know that at our field, Eric, nobody draws the runner's lane on the, on the small diamond. And were you aware of the runner's lane? Do you know? I mean, you've done high school, you know, you know, it exists. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah, but were you yeah, aware? If you have a guy running as yeah. a catcher, if you have a guy running up, uh, you have dropped third strike. You got a bunt, and you got a guy running on the in. You got a guy running on the inside. Your first baseman or you as the catcher should be right yelling inside, 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 and throw that right through the middle of the back of the runner. Now that's high school ball. That's definitely not what we're teaching our kids down here because exactly what Darren just said. You know, he has to be on the outside. If he's on the inside, you line up your throw right where he's at. If he's out of if he's out of place. Yeah, no, I, I it's it's not chalked very often down at the down at little league field. Um, and I think that's really good for us to teach the kids that they do have to get out of bounds, that they do have to be on the foul side of that line and after halfway down when there's a when there's a play at first. Like they don't have the right to run up the inside of that base. I like the way I mean I like the way that girls softball does it that they have two first bases. I, I don't know if that'll ever come down to to little league or not, but that's a really explicit, very easy for kids to know where they need to run through and then where the first First baseman also, yeah. so that it, it, yeah. But yeah. Anyway, thanks for helping us cover that. That was an important thing, and now, now, kind of the meat of the conversation. We kind of got through the appetizer here. The the ever popular pickle and rundown. This is where we talk about uh, runners lane violations. We find those. We also find obstruction and interference situations. What I want to talk about is I want to talk about, uh, first of all, as umpires, how do we umpire that? If you're in a two-man crew and you get a rundown or a pickle between first and second, where would you teach the people to go? And then also, you know, to follow up with that, I want to hear from Eric how you guys teach the rundown on the small field, the, the pickle. So we'll start We'll start with, with Darren and get his thoughts. What As an umpire, and, and you're in a two-man crew, in a three-man crew, it's a little easier, but in a two-man crew, how are we going to position ourselves so, A, we don't interfere? Because if we get in the way, it gets, it gets even more confusing and frustrating. How do we get to where we see all the things that we need to be looking for? Small diamond's easy. Big diamond, you're just going to have to work. But on the small diamond, our base umpire is always positioned out at the start of the play, unlike on the big field where they can start inside. So on the small field, our base umpire is going to start with that rundown by themselves. And as the play progresses back and forth, hopefully by the second or third throw, as it's going away from the first baseman, the plate umpire is actually going to come in behind and he's going to yell, I got this half. So now instead of the base umpire having all 60 feet, the plate umpire is going to have half of that play from the inside. The base umpire is going to take the other half of the play from the outside, and it's still going to matter on who has the best angle for the tag. There could still be a tag on the backside of a player 10 feet from me that I cannot see, and I'm going to give up that call to the opposing umpire or vice versa. The base umpire might be 10 feet away. I might see the tag. We're going to take our time. If it's mine, I'm going to tap my chest and say, partner, I got this one. We have a tag, he's out or she's out. So that's how the way we're going to handle it on a small field. Same thing could apply to third base. Got to be very careful, though, if you're the plate umpire and you slide up there too quickly, 
Because if something blows up and that runner rounds third, you are still responsible for that call at the plate. So same thing, if if it's going back and forth a little bit, going to work my way up two thirds of the way up the line if I'm the plate umpire. As the play goes back towards second base, I'm going to let my partner know I've got this half. And then we're, we're just going to let it work itself out. We've got both sides of it covered and hopefully we'll, one of us will have a good angle on a swipe tag. So we don't have umpires, correct? That are that are following that are chasing the runner back and forth. They're not. They're are they are we head on a swivel standing there, or do you have somebody following this kid as he's running up and down the 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 bases on that? If scenario? it's if we're still by ourselves, we might take three or four steps going okay. back and forth. Once we cut that play in half, it might be one to two strong steps each direction. Yeah, it's not a lot of footwork if. If you're running back and forth with that runner, you're A, going to end up straight lining yourself. So you're going to blow all your angles up. You yeah. really want to stay behind or slightly ahead. You don't want to be even with that runner. So just a couple hard steps until you can get some help. If you don't get that help, you're going to have to work hard to get that angle when the swipe is made. You know, as a coach, and I coached uh, a number of years, as as has uh, Roger, and and Darren. I think you coached also. And yeah. uh, are you you guys are teaching rundowns down there because I've seen you do it. And so I'm curious to know what are you what methods are you using to to teach the kids about the especially on the small diamond about the the pickle or rundown. What what are you guys doing down there? Oh man, as far as like base paths go. Uh, like their their path to the line, we tell them they've got three feet from where they are that they can go one way or the other, and that is their path. So if they round and they're way out behind the first base and the second baseman, and now they got to get back to one of the two bases, you know, we teach them not don't come, don't run to the middle of the two bases and then go to one of the bases. And so we do teach them that they have a that from where they stop or where it's going to try to make an attempt at tagging them, they have a direct line from that point to either base. And then once they start heading towards that base that they're heading toward, you know, now once they turn and head the other direction, again, they have a straight line from that point to yeah. that base and that they can jump one way or another to try to avert a tag. Once if they are, if they're too far out of that, that's very easy for them to get called out. So it depends on where they start. They have a straight line to each one. And I don't know, you guys correct me if I'm wrong, but, but yeah, that's uh, from what I remember, that's the way that we would teach them. And then so, of course, defensive. Yeah. Defensively, you know, how would push- you guys do that? Yeah, I mean, we push them back to the base. Like, if you're if you're a defender, you know, you obviously want them to go back to the base and not be able to advance. We have a couple of different ways that, ways that we teach pickles, but um, defensively, if you can get them to go out of that base path to try to get out of the tag and keep chasing them out of the base path, and they're out whether you get them or not. So you're 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 pinching them back to the bag, and uh, that is how I taught it, especially in minors. I absolutely did not want my minors kids to, to do a pickle because we always ended up uh, getting scored on that way because somebody would drop a ball or overthrow get excited on the majors field we always tried to do a two or a three throw pickle and move that runner back to the back and and but a two or three because it's a huge now on the on the bigger diamond roger's got a little more experience up there than i do but on the bigger diamond it's a little different because you got older kids with some better motor skills that can catch and throw and and control their adrenaline but on the small diamond even in the majors even my 12 year old all-stars team our job was to chase the runner back to the bag what we did starting about 11 years old 10 10 11 years old is it was a game of catch we started off the the first, the first practice that we were going to run the pickle drill, it was a game of catch. You had two people, you had uh, two lines of players, half of the players on one line, half of the player. Didn't, you don't have to have bases. Half of the players on the other line. Uh, the first player throws the ball to the other line and then runs, it takes about six feet wide and runs to the other end of the line. And then the player that was on the other line throws it back and does the same thing in reverse. And then you just kept on playing catch and, what, and you just, it, and we tried to get them to start playing it very slow at first, and then we increased the tempo so that it, that it, at some point that it was a catch and run. Eventually, hopefully, right after a practice or two. Once that got down, then we inserted the base runner, and then we kept it. We run that at ten or eleven or twelve years old. By the time they were thirteen or fourteen years old, they could do that really well. It was a warm up drill for us then at that point. Right. It was something that we ran for five ten minutes, uh, most every practice. Uh, got the kids running, and uh, definitely the whoever was in the middle 
was tired after about two or three rounds and we were inserting push-ups when there was a bad throw uh the whole team five push-ups or whatever when one player missed it it can be a drill that's run that that enforces the baseline enforces everything but just enforces just playing catch which is baseball and it's exactly so on the 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 three feet is different for the body size of a 15 year old six foot 15 year old boy than it is with a 10 year old with a 10 year old kid or 10 year old girl three feet's a very different number and so as umpires how do we know that it was three feet that they deviated from their their base path bag in order to, to ring them up what do you what are you looking at on that darren that would you know that would help us figure this out what we're looking for is basically a step and a reach a step and a reach is going to be in the proximity of three feet with anybody it's probably going to be more than that with a taller kid or an older kid but a step and a reach and like a full extension and if the base runner can still get around that glove we we probably have a problem getting back to the way you guys are teaching the rundown I love what you guys are doing. You guys are nailing it. What I look for as an umpire is the more people that get involved, the funner it is for me because now you're making me work hard. Not only do I have a brand new base path every time that ball is thrown and players are attempting to step and reach and tag that runner, I've also got to watch for obstruction. I, I've seen rundowns with six to eight kids. Oh, yeah. One throw, peel off. One throw, peel off. And it's really exciting because it's like, I'm going to get him for a struck. No, I'm not going to get him. I'm going to, nope, I'm not going to get him either. I'm not, nope, I'm not going to get him. And it's over and over again when the kids are well taught. And then finally something happens. Either the player successfully run back to the last base or I get an obstruction. I get to ward the next base. But it's really nice to hear the way you guys are teaching the kids. And I, I, I get real excited when a hot box or a rundown occurs. You it always cracks me up, especially with the little guys, is you know they've been they've been taught to pickle well, and somebody comes in and their shoes untied, and they end up tripping and falling as a defender, and then the the uh, runner trips over them. <laughs> Yeah. trying to get to the bag and i've got obstruction i'm sorry <laughs> i know that's the hard part after such good hard work and having to bail them out with an obstruction well remember to tell those kids right after you release that ball you got to peel off and get out of the way eric do you have any anything to share on that uh no just maybe from on the coaching side like the step and reach sometimes if that kid is not actually in the base path and they step and reach and the guy jumps out of the way we see that we see that they're rung up if the angle you know and of course darren's talking about when he has a perfect angle right and he knows exactly where the guy's at but the hard part and i'm kidding i'm of course being facetious but like the really hard part with that one is when a kid's not in the base path and the and the runner jumps out of the way and then keeps running and he gets called out because he was left that three foot lane or whatever so it's just so hard because those angles if you don't have that good angle it's just it's hard to see right so you're a third base coach and you you have an angle or when you do see a kid that goes outside i pity the umpire i i hate i hate when that happens because it's one that just is uh is so difficult and probably why you decided to do this as a uh, as a podcast because it's one that we see all the time it wow. happens multiple times a season to every team somebody thinks they have a better angle somebody thinks that and they don't know the rule or you know a green umpire to really know what to call yeah it's really that's that's that happens all the time i have a question that i want to ask and this is more for Derek. so i had a situation we had a situation one of our players one year started off got in a pickle between first and second and then it was major's ball happened. The ball got overthrown, got thrown out in the outfield. Runner gets goes uh, between second and third. They throw the ball to third. He gets in a pickle between second and third. Again, baseball happens. They throw it up against the fence. Runner gets then caught in a pickle between home and third. Finally, he gets out because he just got he got gassed. The poor kid must have been in that pickle for about 45, minutes, 45 seconds to a minute. But as an umpire, I'm curious how that rotation should work. You talked about how the plate umpire would come up and maybe you would do halves. How are we pivoting that around so that we get that coverage when the play keeps advancing and yet we still have fielders and chaos going everywhere? Well, the fun thing is if that's only one base runner, it's not too hard to handle. But if you have trail runners behind him, 
I'm going to leave my base umpire behind. Once I come up to third and we split that in half, if there's trail runners, I will lose the base umpire. And I'm going to have to take the full end of that, either going into third or coming home all by myself. In an ideal situation, it would only be one base runner, two umpires. But there are times where we have multiple base runners. For me, if I had a kid out between first and second, I would rotate up from the play. As soon as that play broke from second to third, I would probably cut across the diamond. I wouldn't go back to the point of play, but I'd cut across the diamond, probably near the pitcher's mound, but work my way into foul territory. I wouldn't stay inside on that one. And then once it blows up at third, boy, that's a tough one because I'm going to be in his way either way I go. So maybe it would have been smarter to stay inside and not cross the foul ball line and try to take the hot box from the inside. Or if I take it from the outside, I've got to be cognizant of the fact that I can't get in front of that runner and me be the one who interferes and have to give him home because of my incompetence. So that's a great question, Roger. Exactly. And what it is, is I don't care if there's 10 umpires out there. There is not a possibility that we are going to see 100% of the action. We're just not. I mean, we're going to we use our training. We're going to position ourselves. We're going to do the best we can. That's all you can do in the game of baseball. It's just the best you can. Darren, can I ask you another question about that pickle? Yeah. So the guys, let's, let's put him in that first between first and second. He yeah. rounds first. He's kind of way out there behind the second baseman. He turns and runs back to first. But now he turns, say, say we know where his base path, base path is from his spot to first base. But when he turns his head and heads towards second, he creates a new base path between him and first base, correct? I mean, him and, him and second base, correct? You are Not correct. Him, okay. You are correct. And then, and he, he, then, if he, then takes, he turns around again. Yeah. And yeah, he, he's creating so, a whole new base path. So you know, I mean, and you know, and you know the situation I'm talking about. A kid that's going back and forth, back and forth, but yep. now he's like eight feet out of the base path, and some umpires like, no, he's out, he's out, because whoa, he's way out of the base path, and yet he had created by right. I mean, maybe yep. staying outside of those three feet, but he got a little bit further away staying outside i mean in those three feet but he got a little further you know what i mean like that's that's another one that just oh man at what point that leads to our next our next scenario which is the skunk in the outfield and this is a great time to uh, answer that question and then use the uh the play that roger and i want to discuss about skunk in the outfield and so we'll go ahead and address that and then we'll 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 segue into the into that there's there's actually a play here eric that that is is part of this. So go ahead. Yeah, as you said, Eric, every time he turns his head and shifts direction or changes direction, he's creating a whole new base path. Now, if you get umpires that haven't done it for a while, they might be thinking that the base line is a straight line between first and second base. And if they start to stray outside of a three foot arc on either side of that, they're gonna nail him for being out of the base path. That is an right. incorrect assumption. Every time that player is working themselves farther and farther away from that straight line, and even sometimes out onto the grass, if there isn't a step and reach being made at this point in time, I've got to look, I've got to see where the runner is, I've got to know where that new base path is, and now that the fielder has the ball, as long as he attempts to go in that straight line, I don't care if he's six feet wide of the fielder, that's his base path. He's entitled to that until that runner comes in and tries to close the gap and make a step and a reach. A, a classic example of that is at the start of a play, a fielder is playing up on the grass. The base runner is running in a direct line to the base. Now, just because the fielder is 12 feet forward, he doesn't get to stand up, reach out three feet, and the runner running in a straight path to the next base isn't going to be called out of the base path because he's running a straight line to the next base. It's the fielder's fault for being 12 feet away and now trying to make a step and reach on him, if that makes sense. Right. Yep. I think the critical thing here, though, is, is it's when the tag, and this is, goes back to the, both the Little League and the Major League rule, is that there has to be a, an attempt for a tag, right? Yep. So that, that and I think this goes to that skunk in the outfield thing, and I'm going to go to there in a second. The baseline gets established at, at that point, but keeping in mind, like if they're trying to avoid a tag, that's when we get into those issues where they get really outside of the three feet. They could run a zigzag, they could run serpentine all the way down to the base if they wanted to, as long as there's not an attempt to tag. 
right? Absolutely. You, you hit it right on the head. So and until there's an attempted tag, that's when we establish the step and reach. And at that point, you know, we can try to guess which way their base path is going. And, and usually it's pretty obvious. It's those situations where they're going to get tagged anyway, and then they try to jump around the glove. Those are the easy ones where you get the out of the base path. Roger, go ahead and, and you know, reference the skunk of the outfield. People know what we're talking about. Some some baseballers know, but you could explain it, maybe the article you read and, and how it works, and then we can start conversating. So the article comes, the article is, and there's been a couple different ones, but the one that we're referencing is one that was published in 2019 on ESPN's website. And it was about a high school game that happened a few years before. The setup for the article is that essentially a baseball play on average runs about six to eight seconds. And this one baseball play ran for about 90 seconds, which is very much an outlier to the standard baseball play. What it is, is you have uh, runners at first and third, and the offense is trying to generate essentially a free path for the runner at third to come home by uh, distracting the defense. And the way they do that is that they, the runner at first will run into shallow right field. And they can do this because there is not an attempted tag. They can There is no essential baseline to be stated. They run out to shallow right field. They draw the attention of the pitcher. The pitcher then generally steps off the mound and they go to pursue the run, the R1 or the runner that was from first. Hoping, and then the offense is hoping that he forgets about the runner at third, the runner at third will come home. Generally, the way they defend this is they actually, the, the pitcher will throw it to the shortstop. The shortstop kind of then plays an intermediary. And as soon as the umpire determines that they're, that, that a tag is being attempted, the runner at first has to either go directly toward second base or directly toward first base. They can't retreat necessarily away from the runner more than three feet if they're going outside of those two particular lines. And so that is the general play of Sunk in the Outfield. I don't recommend teaching this uh, on this on the small diamond. There are so many opportunities for to steal with pass balls. Maybe in an all stars game, you know, to me that one almost feels like the hidden ball trick. It it's just there's so many opportunities to to move the kids. You know, maybe when they're in high school, 14, 15, 16 years old, that might be something. What, what do you think on what, what are your thoughts on that, Eric? Oh, you know, I mean, I hadn't even heard of it before you told me about it earlier today. And so I was just watching it as Roger was talking about it. And I wanted to ask Darren about this, this, this attempted tag thing. So the guy just keeps running backwards. He's so far away from the guy with the ball. He's kind of going back and forth a little bit, but he just keeps working his way out or deep out into right field, out onto the grass. And they're really not making an attempt to tag him. So if the attempt to tag isn't there, so if you're the guy with the ball and he's going away from you, do you just take a step towards him and attempt to tag him? And he's so far out there in no la-la land that, like, if he starts to run out further, is that then? There was an attempt to tag. Does that establish? Because I'm watching this going, this got to be, this has to be easy to defend because it doesn't seem like there was this attempt to tag. Therefore, there was never a line established between him and a base. So he was able to just kind of keep walking away. So to, to kind of further what he's trying to say is like, so at what point for an umpire, Darren, do we determine that a tag is being attempted? Like how close do we need to be or how close does the fielder need to be to the runner to it be determined that a tag is being attempted? In a situation that we were just discussing for me, if a, if a fielder's got the ball, the runner now has got to, make a straight line to either base, either back to first, back to second, back to second, back to third. If that fielder now is attempting to make a tag and that runner steps away from the base, I don't mean the opposite direction, but I mean towards the grass in either direction, I'm going to probably start to get my dander up that he's got to at least attempt to get back into this infield, especially if the defender is running at him, takes a step and swipes at him, if he isn't going towards either base in a direct line, I can get him now for being out of the base path. Yeah, because sometimes the next fielder to get the ball will be nowhere near the runner. I, I can't just call him out because he's 10 feet away. And now the fielder's chasing him. The fielder's got to chase him and get to a point where he forces that runner to not run directly at either bag 
And if a swipe is made, that's going to give me the step in the reach to warrant calling him out. Does that so, make sense? Yeah. yeah. So where do yeah, we that's get what, Travis yeah, That's Steve. what the offense wants him to do, too, yeah. which yeah. is the, the, the irony of it all, right? The offense wants the, the fielder to get so far out there that he's making an attempt to tag. That way, R3 is touching home while he's doing that. But Does that make I, sense? Sure. Yeah, exactly. Like I feel like skunk in the skunk in the whatever is is like the hidden ball trick to, for somebody who's never seen it before, right? Yeah, like I'd never seen it. I'm looking at this, going, this just looks like something that nobody had ever thought about. And well, it, yeah, if you can catch somebody sleeping on not watching YouTube, you might get away with it. You know. So, well, so the let's hope, talk about the hope is, is that you get your shortstop to run at that guy. That's what you want. That's what the that's what the offense wants. The offense wants a shortstop or the pitcher to run at the outfielder. And then as soon as that, uh, as soon as they commit to the, the runner from first, that's when your runner from third is going to come in and he's going to, he's going to walk home. So say that guy's walking backwards and the pitcher's got the ball. How many steps does he have to take towards that guy before that guy no longer can retreat? Like I have the ball, I'm looking at him. I take a step and I reach and he goes backwards. Is that two steps out of the, you know, three foot baseline? It's well, in this situation, like, you're probably about 140 feet from from home plate. For sure, you're way, you're really far away from him. But if you're making this attempt at him, can he continue yeah. to retreat out further? Nope. But at that point, the run scored, and they don't really care about the out. You know so, what I mean? That, that, that that's, well, that's I mean, what they wanted you to do. It seems like a gray area that's going to have to get cleaned up because if a, if a pitcher is on the pitcher's mound and that guy's retreating out and you take a couple steps towards him and he keeps kind of retreating out, at least by the definition of this step and tag, or it seems like they shouldn't be allowed to continue to retreat. Like you shouldn't have to chase them all the way out there. And I, I get what you're saying, Roger, that they that they want you to to go far away, but it seems like just a are you, are you hearing what I'm saying, Darren? Like, it, it seems like as soon if I'm making an attempt at you, now I I should be able to lock you in just like deer in the headlights. Like, all right, now he has to commit, just like you said. And if he doesn't, I shouldn't have to worry about this guy at third because I shouldn't, like, stay where you are if you want to. But if, if you go back any further, you're now out, right? Wouldn't you? So, so let's, let's segue no. into the travesty of the game because it, we got to make a distinction here. You brought it up uh, in a conversation earlier about we you know especially in little league we have to be paying attention to you bet so on the little league side this, this is going to be totally different from high school college pro ball we have the, dis the, the discretion to if we think a travesty is being made we can rule under it and i think it's 903 c the umpire's judgment anything not in the book we have the right to to basically invent the rule on the spot and enforce it so in a situation like that if it were a little league game if the player keeps retreating by rule, it's supposed to be okay. But what's the intent of the play? The intent of the play is to confuse the other team and generate a cheap run. In my opinion, not all umpires may judge this way, but in my opinion, they're making a travesty of the game. And I want you on my field, Darren. I want you on my field. I completely agree. Yeah. Better ways to generate runs than that. On the big diamond, you have that player on first when you have a first and third situation. You have well, that you can lead off. Off. take a few slow steps, but you don't send them out into right field. Yeah, and you can lead off there too. Like this is a this would yeah. have to be done if it were on majors and minors on the small field. This would have to be done like on the throwback to the pitcher where but I can see somebody in our small little division. I can see somebody trying to pull this now that it's right, right. Which I think would be a travesty of the game. The point of illustrating with this was actually really not about the play in it itself, but that it took the rule of the base path and that the base path wasn't established until the tag was made. And I thought it was a good illustration of showing that the base path can be really anywhere. And it doesn't really start until an attempted tag is made on a runner. So that, so that creates different angles or at least a different thought on that. Yeah, no, I, no, you, I, I, if dude, you ask I my wife, Robert, you're bringing it back. No, I love right. that you're bringing it back to that because I can't legitimately, if I'm on the pitcher's mound, attempt to make a tag to a guy who's 70 feet away from me. I guess back there, like I'm not actually making an attempt to the tag on him unless I throw the ball, right? Absolutely. Well, and, and again, if you ask my wife or you asked the, you asked a lot of people, and I'm probably, if you pulled the fans at your local Little League or your probably, maybe even your local tournament baseball or even a high school or whatever, you ask them, maybe even a major league game, where the baseline is, they're going to draw a diamond between 
home and first, first to second, second to third, and third to home. And that line doesn't exist. And I thought that this play illustrates how that doesn't exist. When, when I train umpires, I always use the illustration. We have a ball that's hit to the outfield. It's, it's going to be at least three bases. The batter runner rounds first and sees grandma out right field. So he runs all the way out to the fence and gives grandma a high five. Now he comes back into the infield. He gets to second base and the ball still hasn't been picked up yet. And he sees his other grandma at center. So he <laughs> runs out to center field and he gives grandma number two a high five. And he comes back and now somewhere between second and third base, the ball is coming in. What do you guys rule on the play? And nine out of 10 umpires will raise their hand and say, he was out of the baseline or the base path, I would call him out. But the rule doesn't say that. Little Johnny or little Betty can do that. I wouldn't coach it. I wouldn't encourage it. Right, I right, haven't yeah. had a rule to enforce for them doing that. I had a guy that was a, a Division A player. He was, re in fact, we coached against him. Uh, Roger probably knows who I'm talking about. I won't, I won't say his name. But he was really, really big on and and took some of these bush plays personally. It's like, why would you do this bush play against me? What seriously? Are we here to play baseball or are we just screwing around? I guess there's you know there's an honoring the sanctity of the game, and at some point you look at the age level of the children or and is that really playing ball when we're doing hidden ball tricks? Or we're teaching a, a 10 year old or 11 year old to, to run all the way out to, to, to right field. I mean, are we really teaching the game when we're just looking at ways to get cheap runs or cheap outs? Yes, there are things we can do. Yes, the, the, in the minors and majors, they all lead off from third and shake their tush at the, at the pitcher, and try to upset the pitcher so they can, they can score. And that's just natural stuff. But some of these things, it, it's hard enough teaching a kid to throw a baseball and to catch a baseball and then hit a baseball that alone in their by their 12th year takes time I mean, it it takes time i would rather be teaching a, a child those skills running hitting catching throwing uh over trying some way to confuse another 11 or 12 year old kid are, do, are you guys with me on that i mean yep. do you agree well i i do i think it goes back to something that i think darren had said at one point about having to unlearn so you're not going to teach something that you're going to have to unlearn. You're not going to be able to get away with that on the majors level, the, the, some of these things that you do at the minors level or 13 or 14 year ball. Like you, you don't want to have to unlearn the shenanigans of minors baseball a year later, two years later, three years later, because it just doesn't work. I, I just don't consider the cheap bush plays. And yes, I've tried it. I, I tried the hidden ball trick. I, try, I, I tried the, the cheap run to second. But in the minors and majors, especially regular season, and I'm not talking all-stars because that's a different animal altogether, but regular season, each team may only have three or four kids that are actually players. Then the rest of the kids are maybe first or second year kids, and we want them to come back. We want them to grow. They, we want them by the time they get to high school, they're comfortable. If all they're doing is these cheap, these cheap tricks and all this stuff, I just don't see as a coach... And really, as a dad and a, and a human being, as a father, and in a you know, is this really what we need to be teaching children? What do you think on that, Eric? Next question. Of course, I agree with you, man. I think some of these guys' intentions. Sometimes we have to look at these other coaches that haven't played a lot of baseball, that are trying to keep their kids engaged. They're like, and they don't know how to teach kids how to throw. They don't know how to teach kids how to catch. They just keep saying, "Aim for the glove." kids are bored with that because they're not actually giving them good instruction so then they take them out here on the field and they show them this other thing that the kids think is fun you know then the kids like that because they're maybe learning something a little bit different because they don't have good instruction on catching and throwing i look at that and i, I pity those kids that have those coaches but i think that's why leagues i think it's why it's important for a league to have a coach's clinic and make sure that every coach gets instruction from seasoned coaches on how to coach because all too often Hey, will you coach a team? And it's a dad like you're talking about who has never learned how to coach. I became a a better coach 50 fold when I started umpire because you get to see how other people run their house. You, you get to see stuff and you learn stuff and you you see, oh, that's why that rule is that way. And that's why they're doing this. That's what I feel that's when I really became a little league coach is when I started umpiring. It made me a better coach. 
I, I, I can say that. I, I think sometimes when I would see guys I knew, they felt a little intimidated because they knew I knew the empiring side of things as well as the managerial and the coaching. So I think it gave me a leg up. And getting back to what you talked about in terms of teaching the right way versus teaching the wrong way, if you look at our rule book, our rule book is about 95% verbatim of what Major League Baseball is. We have safety stuff included, but we draw our Little League rules out of the Major League Baseball rule book. When that rule book first came out, when the game was first starting, I'm willing to go out on a limb and say it was probably less than 20 pages. <laughs> you look at that rule book today, I, I'm willing to guess it's probably 105 to 130 pages. The reason it has gotten so thick in 100 years' time is because people out there think of this great thing they're going to go out and do. After a while, people say, that's not fair. That's not fair. We need a rule against it. So then all of a sudden there's a rule that comes into place and we have to enforce that rule to stop that guy from doing what he's doing. We so, had that last year in our league too. When you let kids play in a sandlot situation where the adults aren't involved at all, you would be surprised at how uh, sportsmanlike these kids are, how important it is to them that everything is fair. You'll notice a child that's 8, 10, 12 years old, their sense of justice is so ingrained. And when they're playing with their buddies or whatever, hey, that's not fair. That's not fair. And that means a lot to an 8, 10, 12, 14-year-old kid. That's not fair. At some point, the adults, when they get involved, it, it becomes, well, you know, I got to win these games. I've been that coach that went up and shook the other coach's hand after we got beat. And I, and I said to him, congratulations on beating a bunch of nine-year-olds. How do you feel about that? You know, he'll give me that dirty look and walk away. But it's true. Let the kids play ball. Teach them the basics. And when they get to high school, like Roger's kids, and then they can play some, of, they can do some of these tricks. Some of these tricks they do in high school, you will never see in, on the college diamond. You'll never see in the MLB because they're beyond it. For some reason in high school, they're teenagers. They want to do the hidden ball trick. They want to trick somebody. And, and in my opinion, that's, that's not really baseball. I want to thank all three of you guys for being with us today. Uh, this has been a great podcast. I've learned so much. Uh, any parting words? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go around the room. Eric, anything you want to add or say? No, no. Uh, except that there's 233 pages in the Little League handbook, <laughs> Little League rule book. So a lot of bad dads out there. No, I'm just kidding. You know, um, 233 pages though, you know? So yes, you're right. They've had to create a lot of things around safety for kids. And, um, I, uh, I think some of those are, are necessary, but all too many of them are written down that are just, yeah, two things. Uh, getting back to uh, fairness and justice, when you just let the kids play the games, how do they settle a disagreement when when both sides are dug in and they, they just can't come up with, with an answer? What they usually propose is, let's just do it over. And guess what? <laughs> they do it over and then they move on. They, they don't dwell on it. That's the beauty of letting the kids do it. And the, the second point I wanted to add was earlier, when we were talking about the runner's lane, I want to make it clear that in order to get that out from a runner's lane violation, you still have to have a quality throw or a throw that would have completed the play for an out. You can't just throw it out into right field and hope the umpire's going to give you an out for that. Hey, uh, Darren, have you ever, can I ask one Go question? Ahead, yeah. I hate to, hate to bird walk, but no, no. You, you said that the kids will often just say do over. And, you know, in my years, I, gosh, maybe only once or twice, but I do feel like there's been like a do-over or two that, um, is there, is, is, is there any, is there anywhere in the rule book where there's a do-over or is that? In the case of an know? infield fly, we can do a do-over on an infield fly if it's misapplied. For example, if it's in effect and we forget to call it, we can not necessarily start the play over, but we can fix what went wrong on the play. So in mm -hmm. essence, get the play right for us having screwed up as umpires and not recognizing it, signaling it, and calling it or applying it accordingly. Outside of that, 
Eric, you'd force me to have to think a little bit to find some other readers. That's okay. Next podcast. I want to hear it on the next podcast. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that, so that's why I asked. You know, yeah. you meant you brought it up, and it it was genuinely a question. So, yeah, yeah you bet. I'll I'll come up with something. Um, so the one thing I'd say is, uh, if anybody's looking for unique ways or unique baseline or routes to base paths, um, just Google like T-ball videos or what have you, and you'll find 15, 20 minutes of five-year-olds trying to run to first base by going to the pitcher's mound first and then going to second, back to first, then home. So if you're looking for just a lighthearted uh, base running, like unique base running paths, uh, YouTube's for you and T-ball. So uh, thank you guys again for your time this evening. Uh, you know, we've kind of reached the end Again, uh, that I'm so excited that uh, with the participation and the reception of this podcast, I've heard some really good things, and lots of people are excited to hear this next one. And then very soon we will be recording another one with a different set of umpires for the interference and the obstruction. But thanks again. It's just amazing to me to have the quality people that have stepped up and are willing to do this for free not only for education but there is some entertainment going on here for me anyway i mean i could sit around uh with you guys and we could go at this for four hours thank you maybe maybe not but thank you definitely for hosting this (laughs) yeah anywho i gotta like all of us we have uh partners they're looking at us thinking hey are we having dinner or what but thanks a lot you guys Rules and opinions discussed here are personal interpretations from seasoned umpires and coaches. The podcast is not directly endorsed, nor are we compensated by any youth sports body, including Little League Baseball. Actual applications of these rules and coaching ideas may vary depending on your location or your league's official rules, so please discuss those with your local umpire chiefs and league presidents. You know, and that's always a good idea. You might want to talk to the people that know about the rules before you start just doing them yourself. That's why we're doing this. So anyway, thank you so much again, Roger. Thanks for your help. And uh, we'll see you next time. See ya.